Grab your camping gear because we're headed back to the woods for today's movie. We're going up the mountain to do some camping. <laughs> Only a fool would do that. Well, we got five of them in here. Welcome to Sick Flicks, where I take a deep dive into the cinematic sewer to help you embrace your inner gore geek. I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, and today we're tackling Jeff Lieberman's backwoods slasher flick, Just Before Dawn. Released in 1981, Just Before Dawn is another in a long line of early slasher efforts. It's mostly memorable because George Kennedy turns up in a supporting role, but there are still fans out there who regard it as something of a cult classic. If you like your slashers in isolated locales with crazy mountain folk, this one is definitely worth a look. But is Just Before Dawn splattery? Let's get to the gore and find out. We fade in on this wilderness tableau. Um, are we sure this is just before dawn? Looks like it could just as easily be just before sunset to me. And wait a minute, is this movie before sunrise with an alternate title? If I see Ethan Hawke, I'm out. And on to the credits. Starring Chris Lemon, son of Jack Lemon. No really, it's his kid. And Mike Kellen, who previously turned up on Sick Flicks as Mel, the camp owner in Sleepaway Camp. And George Kennedy. <laughs> How the hell did they wrangle George Kennedy into this movie? Was he behind on his car payment or what? Directed by Jeff Lieberman, who also gave us the cult classic Squirm. With the credits over, we head to this abandoned church where Mike Kellen's about to deliver the Sunday sermon. Dear Lord, thank you for this whiskey I'm about to receive, and protect me with your blessing as I drunk drive home through the forest. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Jim Beam, Amen. Honestly, this dude's favorite saint is probably Jack Daniels. I think he took the whole Holy Spirits thing way too literally. Lord, they have all deserted your old church, but I am bringing back the Holy Spirits! I also want to point out that this print looks terrible, and yet it's sourced from the new Code Red Blu-ray release of the film. Guessing they didn't spend a lot of time remastering it. At any rate, it's got more grain than a field of rice. Back in the movie, Mass is interrupted when they spot this dude peeping. You know why this church is sacred ground? Because it's got a holy roof. Rachel, something is up there. Aw, oh, Ty, that's just the DTs talking. Ty heads out to investigate, and it looks like their buck is out for revenge. Well, I guess the drunk driving got started without him. Rachel! Also, is this like a Ford Pinto pickup truck? I think sure blew up easily. Back inside, Ty's nephew runs into the killer. <laughs> hey, nice to meet you. Then we jump over to another movie, where our future victims are riding around in their sweet Winnebago. They're basically just going to drive us through some exposition. They're going up to the mountain because they've inherited some property. The lawyer showed us some aerial slides when my dad bought the place. Anyway, they're cruising along when they run right into this prop deer head. No, not Bambi! Warren, did you see the poor thing? No, brah. It's hard to see the road while you're pounding brewskis. They stop to survey the damage. Well, since we're here, might as well empty the shitter, I guess. Well, he's out there doing that. It's like he's wandered into a Rockwell song because somebody's watching him. Then he heads back inside and delivers a report. That well, must have been a pretty tough little buck. Took right off. Now, beer me. And say what you will about Warren, but that dude blows. Literally. From there, we jump over to Mr. Miyagi's place, where he's trimming his bonsai trees. Ruin everything that you're trying to do. Oh wait, that's George Kennedy. Where's Frank Drebin? Outside, there's some horsing around going on. What is the matter with you? This tender moment between man and horse is interrupted when our heroes arrive. Shut that whole thing off! You're scaring my plants and my horse to boot! They explain why they're headed up the mountain, but George is unimpressed. That D don't mean nothing. That mountain can't read. Whoa, whoa, let's not shame the mountain for being illiterate. Maybe it's just a slow learner. At any rate, George is full of warnings. It ain't just poison ivy I'm talking about, son. It's poison oak, too. You don't want to wipe with that and get it in your crack. Believe you me, I'm the voice of experience. They head up the mountain, but have to stop again. Yeah, sorry, shitter's full again. Told you stopping for Taco Bell was a bad idea. Anyway, they investigate their way right into this jump scare. Remember Ty? Yeah, he's still in this movie. Help me. My nephew's still up there. Turns out Ty's still detoxing from all that booze. Get it away from me. Get what away from you? Demons. 
At any rate, these guys are the best Samaritans ever. Look, just stay with, on the road. You'll be all right. Yeah, sorry, drunk traumatized dude. Just stick to the road. You'll get home eventually. They leave Ty behind to fend for himself, but they do pick up an extra passenger. <laughs> I'm sure he just needed a lift. And yeah, they're still driving. I guess we're gonna make this trip in real time. Eventually, Warren gets the RV stuck. That's it, folks. In the line. <laughs> nice work, Warren. That means they're going the rest of the way on foot. There's some big falls. Should be about a mile from here. Let's hope we're not going to watch them walk there in real time. But hey, maybe they'll run into the guys from Night of the Demon on the way. They set up camp, and Warren and Jonathan head back to the RV to get some more stuff. All right, Jonathan and I will go back for the rest of the stuff. When night falls and they're not back, everyone starts to worry. Hey, do you think they ditched us? Before anyone can answer, they realize they're being watched too. Bigfoot? Jason? Madman Mars? Come on guys, I know it's one of you. And if you guessed it was all an elaborate jump scare, well, no screenwriter's credit for you because that shit was obvious. <laughs> the guys start harassing Danny for being a wimp. I just wasn't sure it was you. So you peed in your pants to play it safe, huh? No, I didn't. Well, okay, maybe a little, but it's because I have bladder control issues. The downside of this little stun is Warren's gonna be sleeping alone tonight. You know you don't pull things like that out here, Warren. The next morning, they enjoy the beauty of the waterfall. Something, isn't it? It's like God's just peeing on the forest to make it grow. Connie isn't interested in any of that, though. She's got some foreshadowing to do. Everyone goes camping all the time. I know how to pitch a tent. I know how to start a fire. But I couldn't pick up the knife. I'm just not the hardened killer I thought I was. Eventually, they break camp and set out to explore after hearing this strange singing. Sounds like somebody's singing, doesn't it? During their exploration, they find this weird girl, but she's not performing for free and dashes off into the woods. By this point, many people make the assumption that director Jeff Lieberman was paying homage to The Hills Have Eyes and The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But Lieberman says he never saw those films and was instead influenced by Deliverance. They head deeper into the woods and find this rope bridge. I'm pretty sure this is where Indiana Jones sent a lot of cultists to their death in Temple of Doom. At any rate, we're 35 minutes into this movie and barely anyone has died. I thought just before Dom was the title, not how long it would take to get to the kills. Anyway, the good news is Warren's gonna tell us how to navigate this rope bridge. Just put one foot in front of the other. Just like if you were walking on your garden hose in your front lawn. Um, who the hell walks on their garden hose in their front lawn? This may not be helpful. Also, if you guess this rope bridge will be important later, give yourself a screenwriter's credit. Clearly, this advice wasn't helpful because Danny almost plummets to his death. I didn't need to get him to pens at this rate. They eventually wind up at the base of the waterfall where Jonathan and Megan sneak away for a little sexy time. But they have an audience. I'm not sure she should be watching this. She doesn't look like she's 17 and I don't see a parent or guardian anywhere. <laughs> oh wait, here he comes. If you thought someone was finally gonna die, I've got some bad news. Everyone lives. Again. This is basically just a scope and grope mission. I can't believe it! <laughs> Back down the mountain, we check in with George Kennedy. Yeah, remember him? He's still in this movie. Turns out Ty made it down the mountain after all. It's been a murder. Well, technically I'm on vacation, but let me call my partner Frank Drebin and the police squad. He might be able to help. Ty then proceeds to give him a description. What is a demon to you, mister? Oh, you know, tall, dark horns on his head, the usual. Well, I guess I better put out an APB on Satan. Back at camp, Megan decides to break the tension with a dance party. At least I think they're dancing. I mean, those could be seizures. It's hard to tell. Jesus, this is the whitest episode of Soul Train since Colobos. So, we're now almost an hour into this movie and still have only had one kill. But hey, we got a dance party, so I guess it all balances out. Then, just when everyone's really getting funky, this happens. Very Come on. Thank you, whoever you are. Turns out it's the singing girl and her family of extras from Footloose. Listen, son, dancing is the first step on the road to damnation. Also, should we really be introducing new characters at this point? I'd be all for it if I thought we were up in the victim pool, but just before Dawn hasn't even killed the characters it started with yet. 
They take off, and Warren's like, damn, guess we need a new boombox. Meanwhile, George is out here. Ha, <laughs> just a man and his horse in the moonlight. I can't quit you, Mr. Ed. And now that the sun's up, I feel like this title is a misnomer. We're clearly well past just before dawn. Jonathan heads off into the woods for the stupidest reason ever. Jonathan, will you go out in the woods and look for some of my makeup? Of course I will. Thank you. But I'm not going to complain, because maybe someone will finally die in this movie. Luckily, he solves the case of the missing makeup in about 10 seconds. <laughs> no, 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 wait a minute. Looks like someone hit her with Homer Simpson's makeup gun. And then this suddenly turns into a penthouse forum letter. Dear penthouse, I never thought these letters were real. But I was out hunting for makeup in the woods and... After some more jibber-jabber, he winds up on the rope bridge where he runs into this guy. He's like, here, let me show you a little life hack as he smashes him with his machete. You, uh, live around this place? No! Oh! This guy's not done, though. Old Hack the Ripper chops down the bridge, sending Jonathan into the water below. He starts climbing the rope like this is gym class, but surprise, the killer's waiting for him at the top. <laughs> Meanwhile, Warren's over here doing his best Jack Handy impression, thinking some deep thoughts. Did you realize that when you clean out a vacuum cleaner, you become a vacuum cleaner? Hey Connie, did you ever wonder what people in China call their good dishes? Then he catches this fish with his bare hands. Ah! You might say that's unreal. This clearly impresses Connie, and he's about to score, but then Jonathan drops in. And then I guess he decides to score with Jonathan instead. <sighs> Connie hears a real Sherlock Holmes. He was murdered, wasn't he? What's the whistle? He was calling for help. Maybe he was just playing a tune. I mean, who can say? Back at the church, Danny's putting the moves on Megan, which makes this inbred mutant stabby. <gasps> Whoa! Oh! <gasps> Asshole. Make flees inside, but surprise, there's a killer in there, too. The good news is this guy's got the camera, so there'll be plenty of crime scene photos. With everyone but Warren and Connie dead, they head to the Hill People's house for help. Hello? Unfortunately, they're useless. Don't know nothing about that. Then it's time for some more deep thoughts. Is the S or the C silent in the word sent? How did people who made the first clock know what time it was? Clearly, they didn't do enough deep thinking because they're about to make the slasher film rookie mistake of splitting up. I'll be right back. You stay here. And with that, Warren heads off over the river and through the woods, but he doesn't find Grandma's house, just dead Jonathan. Together, they reenact scenes from Weekend at Bernie's. God damn it, Jonathan! Oh. Meanwhile, George Kennedy's still on the prowl. And just in case you didn't realize the killers are the singing girl's brothers, here you go. Kip. The devil raised his head in our family, Mary Cat, but they're still your brothers. No! Back at camp, Connie hears the whistle. <laughs> but surprise, it's one of the hillbilly mutants. <laughs> he gives chase and trees her like she's a squirrel. <laughs> While she's stuck, George Kennedy almost blasts Warren. Hi. Back at the tree, Hillbilly Jim's just gonna chop it down with his machete, apparently. Looks like he's making great progress. Timber! He's chasing Connie through the woods again, but George Kennedy's in the mood for murder. I gotta say, Frank and the police squad are not gonna be happy about this. But hey, at least he gives us a genetics lesson. Keep breathing in the same family long enough, something's bound to snap. And now, everyone acts like things are safe and sound. But we know better, right? Of course we do. Because we've seen a slasher movie before, and this film wasn't exactly subtle about the fact the killers are twins. Back at camp, Warren's having another round of deep thoughts. Does a straw have one hole or two? Connie, meanwhile, realizes they're not alone. More devils. The second hillbilly makes his move, but remember that bit with Connie about not being able to use the knife earlier? Told you that was foreshadowing. <laughs> she's on Hillbilly Jim's back like she's the fabulous moolah, but then he gets her in the bear hug. <laughs> Things look bleak until she 
rams her fist down his throat? Seriously? Okay, sure. Let's just roll with that. So yeah, she rams her fist down his throat, suffocating him. Order up, one knuckle sandwich, extra fist. Hope you choke on it. The good news is he's dead. The bad news is her hand is stuck in there and she's gonna have to wear his head like a bracelet for the rest of her life. <laughs> or not. So, apparently director Jeff Lieberman wanted to kill no one had ever seen before. And the fist suffocation was what they came up with. He was right, I'd never seen it before, but it's still totally bizarre. <laughs> And as Warren sobs like a baby, the movie ends. I'll be honest, I'm not really sure how Just Before Dawn has garnered a cult reputation over the years. Even by early slasher film standards, it's slow, there aren't many kills, and it commits the unforgivable sin of wasting George Kennedy. And yet, somehow, Just Before Dawn gets hailed as being one of the great backwood slasher films. But personally, I just don't see it. It feels incredibly average to me. I'm not even going to pretend there's enough splatter in this one to get a 5 barf bag rating, but just how many bags can Just Before Dawn eke out? Let's go to the gore card! In terms of gross anatomy, Just Before Dawn is pretty light. We've got one falling death, several stabbings, a gunshot death, and that suffocation by fist. The fist scene is impressive in its sheer audacity, but the rest of the death scenes are pretty ho-hum. Because of that, Just Before Dawn earns a paltry one barf bag rating. This is not a sick flick, but if you really love 80s slashers and want to see them all, you'll have to check it out sooner or later. Looking for a backwoods horror flick with a lot more gore? Then check out my review of Bigfoot slasher flick Night of the Demon. You'll find a link here on the screen. I'll meet you over there. Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, bringing you all the splatter that matters.